Am I on? All right, thank you, Jed. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about stabilized topes and trings, and I have a couple of things to start with before we get going. One is I want to give some credit. Uh, Steve Levitt at the University of Arizona and I used to team teach this, uh, this lecture. We sort of condensed it into one, but I stole a lot of Steve's slides, so he deserves some credit for my talk. Um, the other thing I want to highlight is also something related to what Jed just mentioned, is that many times in this class I feel like an odd person out, because I'm probably the only person in this room that is at a primary teaching institution, okay? Small regional uh, college, no graduate students to speak of, and almost everyone here is from an R1. So um, I, I've been teaching this class for a lot of years, and every so often I get a group of students who want to know, what's it like being at a small private liberal arts college or a teaching institution? And, and what, you know, should I even apply for those kinds of jobs? And it, it's sort of grown. It's grown, grown, grown to, up to the point where Jim has actually given us an evening session where all I'm going to do is talk about life at small colleges. Do you want to apply to small colleges? What is it going to be like? What, 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 is the, what is the teaching load? All this kind of stuff. Students don't even know this. Now you might, un so the, one of the issues is a lot of you do not know where you're going to end up. You might end up at an R1 institution with three mass spectrometers and a full-time technician and, you know, bless you. Go for it. But you might end up at a place like this. And the question that's really most appropriate for this, this, this kind of class is, I've got a passion for doing stable isotope research. How do I continue that if I am employed in a place like this? Okay? Not the same infrastructure, not the same issues. So there's a lot of differences. And so uh, that's Friday night. Uh, it's it's vo completely voluntary. If you don't care, just don't come. It's not, there's not a part of the course per se. There's no, there's no slides or handouts. It's just a conversation. Anyone who wants to have a conversation Friday night, I think it's 5 o'clock, we'll just talk and uh, come if you want. All right? Fair enough. And then the last thing I want to say as introduction is that this is about tree rings, but reality, I want to broaden this conversation to be more about sort of organic matter, plant organic matter in particular. Um, and not, you know, so you might say, well, I don't really care about tree rings, so this is now one of those specialized talks that I can turn my mind off at. But, you know, these models, the things that we're going to talk about, the, the processes, apply to plants in general. If you work on grasses, if you work on ferns, the same kind of things we're going to talk about apply. Now, suppose you say, well, I've, you know, you're not like Jim, you know, animals are boring. You say, no, animals are cool, right? But still, what do your animals eat? And what is the variation in what they eat, especially the herbivores and, of course, the carnivores? So in the, the variation in the plant matter will then be transported to the variation in the organic matter of the, of the animals that you're interested in. Okay? So I think this could be applicable to you to understand that baseline variation. Or even if you're a, a geologist and all you're interested in sediment core records of something, and, you know, uh, you know Brett Tipple has done a lot of work with N-alkanes that are in sediment cores, right? Well, where did those unalkanes come from? Often they came from plants. So understanding the basics of variation in plants will also help you in a geological setting. So I'm hoping this is not just tree rings. You can get a lot more out of it, I think. But you will learn that tree rings are the coolest, and so, you know, you should, you should think about them anyway. All right? So my basic outline is going to be we're going to introduce some tree ring basics, uh, what we do with them. Uh, a little bit on tree ring sampling and processing. We're going to talk about, this is where I think the, the next three points are really more uh, general. We're going to talk about sources of isotopes in organic matter, where they come from, how they incorporated. How do we model that stable isotope variation? How, can we actually get mechanistic models to describe it? Uh, what are the causes of that variation in organic matter? So these three points we're going to spend most of our time on. As sort of Jim says, these are the rules. If you know the rules, then you can, you can go beyond that. Uh, we'll have a little bit of time, hopefully, at the end to do some case studies, some different odd things uh, that people are doing, and up-to-date new things. And then uh, I'll end with maybe some case studies from my lab if we have time. If not, that's okay. Okay? So, let's get going. <coughs> Excuse me. Tree ring basics. Many of you may or should know that trees grow annually, at least in the temperate zone. So this, this, rep this tree ring here represents that year's growth. And they can be precisely dated. Now there's some oddities that you have to think about. And there's ring porous and non-porous. I'm not going to get into that too much. 
But if you remember <clears throat> one of the components that Jim talked about, oh, I think it was yesterday, STIR. Remember that acronym? What was IR? <clears throat> Anybody remember I? Integrate, R, record. Bang. Okay? This, the, the organic matter right there is integrating all the features that that tree is doing into that tree ring. Integrating all the, the climate variation, the water uptake, vary, anything. And it's recording it. And it's recording it precisely dated. This is one of the really cool things about it. We know exactly the date. And we can go back. And there's a number of other biological systems that have sort of tree ring like characteristics. I'm going to think of uh, otoliths and fish, right? They have sort of almost a ring structure. So there's a number of things out there that you can also use this type of thing. But you find something that can be precisely dated, awesome. Because a lot of times our records are sort of, you know, there's no real divining line that you can find. But tree rings are good in that regard. <coughs> okay, what is it composed of? Uh, most of it is uh, these things, carbohydrates, the vast majority of it's cellulose. Uh, some hemicelluloses, some proteins, uh, and a lot of lignin. Lignin is a, a strengthening agent of tree rings and uh, uh, lipids. Now, what you need to do when you're thinking about materials for stable isotope analysis is what component is abundant? What is, there's a lot of it. Well, there's a lot of cellulose, as much as 50%, and there's a fair bit of lignin. The other thing you need to know is what will not decompose over time. And so this decomposition rate means that well, lipids are very low decomposition, but there's not a lot of them in there in some, some trees. Whereas cellulose and uh, lignans are not only abundant, but they're pretty stable. So I actually have a piece of wood from the Pleistocene, and it's wood. It's, not, you know, it's, not, it's, it's actually cellu cellulose. So if you can keep it from, de from uh, decomposing, you can still have it. So um, um, that's pretty good stuff. <coughs> There's another couple terms for tree ring analysis that you need to hear about. One's called sensitive and complacent. A complacent tree is one that has you know, good, you know, their feet in the water table, the conditions are great, soil and nutrients, they grow the same almost every year. They're not particularly sensitive to climate. They're, they, it could be a bad growing year, a good growing year, but they don't care. Uh, a sensitive tree is one that's on a different kind of strata, and you have sh small rings and large rings, small rings meaning a bad growing year, large rings a good growing year. So that means they're sensitive to climate. But the story I want to tell you now, that's just for ring width analysis. The story I want to tell you today is that you can get information off of complacent trees with isotopes. Even if the tree ring is complacent, the isotopes are not. The isotopes can give you variation. And so this is one of the, the beauties of uh, isotopic work. The other term that you might not, have, you might not be familiar with is something we call cross-dating. We're developing chronologies. And it's a very simple concept. Uh, the base, best way to look at it is what we call pattern matching. So we have a series of narrow rings and wide rings and narrow rings. And you sort of say, I'm matching these patterns. Therefore, they're the same years. And so you might have a living tree. You know that when, the, when you cord it. And this might be a dead tree. You don't know exactly when it died, but you can pattern match it. You have archaeological wood that you can pattern match. And by doing so, you can develop chronologies of multiple thousands of years uh, because you're able to, to um, match them together across the Chris? Uh, can, can reproductive events affect the interpretation of tree rings? Um, yes, because there are mass years for some trees. But um, it has to be a fairly large stress uh, event to, to some extent. And oftentimes it's not easy to see. What's, what, what's the general pattern? Or, I just know some plants have like depressed deep production or, or depressed growth after major reproductive events. I'm just wondering if, if, what's the general pattern of the tree rings in those species? They, no, very few people look at that. I don't know hardly anybody that looks at that because it's difficult. Because if you see a narrow wing, you have to make sure you're, you're going off other things other than climate. You'd almost have to have a complacent tree that, that has a reproductive event that then uh, reduces its growth. It's a difficult thing to do. But um, people have looked at, for example, insect attacks, you know, defoliation events. They're, they're even hard to figure out because there's a lot of a, The problem, I say, with tree ring widths is that there are... What causes a narrow ring? I could give you five or six things that could cause a narrow ring. How do you know which one it is? 
okay, a defoliation event, a drought, you know, so all, all kinds of different things. So tree rings are good and they give you a lot of information, but what's often cool, why isotopes are growing in this field is that the isotopes will often narrow that down much more, much better. Another thing that you have to be aware of is what's called ring wedging. So if you look at this core, this slab here, if I took an immigrant core here, I'd count the number of years. If I took the same core there, I've got 14 or 15 extra years. They're gone. You've got to be careful about certain trees. Uh, there's certain species and certain age classes and whatnot that are, we have to worry about this with ancient redwood. But um, the, the cambium, I don't know if you know what a cambium is, a vascular cambium around the tree. Uh, it, when some trees get old, they do, it's not consistently active every year. The old trees can have that problem. Young trees generally not. So these are tree ring chronologies around the world. There's lots of them. The only thing I want to say about this is, where are we missing? Okay? There's a lot missing here. Do you know why? There's a couple reasons. There's, you know, there's not a lot of research going on there, but tropical trees don't produce tree rings often. They never stop growing. Now, if I didn't explain that to you, I should have. You know why they stop growing here? And this is an annual growth ring? It's winter. They stop growing in the winter, and that's the, that's the boundary, and then they start growing again in spring. That's why the, the annual nature of the tree ring, where they don't, the often trees there don't. But guess what? You can use isotopes even in trees that have no tree rings. And you'll see variation in the isotopes over the, the length of that tree that have to do with annual changes. And they're using those things to actually date trees that have no tree rings and look at, uh, look at growth rates with trees that have no tree rings with isotopes. Uh, these are some long chronologies in North America just showing you some of the extent of how, how far these, uh, these are all ring width chronologies. And there are a lot of databases out there that you can get this information from. Okay, the first question I want to, uh, one thing I want to talk about here is why did people get interested in isotopes and tree rings to begin with? What was the first reason why people decided to look into this? Well, guess who? Harmon Craig was one of the first. And he did giant sequoia, sequoia dendron giganteum, 2,500 year record. This is his data of carbon-13 over that time frame. And uh, just sort of his initial study. And what he saw was variation. Whenever you see variation in isotopes, you kind of go, cool. What does that mean? And he was arguing that um, this is probably associated with external conditions on assimilation and respiration rather than atmospheric changes uh, in, in terms of uh, 13 C of CO2. So he's already starting to think that maybe this is giving us information about uh, environmental issues. In terms of water isotopes and tree rings, some of the earliest studies, 76 was, uh, I think the earliest was 74, but this is the eight delta 18 O and some tree rings, and this is the mean annual temperature. So they're basically saying this is a paleo thermometer. The isotopes in the tree rings is what they were looking for. This is what they were interested in, especially the early geochemists. This is related to this. This is uh, deuterium, however, and this is the deuterium in environmental water and the deuterium in the, in the cellulose. And this is a lot of different range, and that line there is not the regression line. That's the one-to-one -one relationship. And so it's saying that the, the cellulose nitrate, the cellulose is recording the environmental water. Now, you see it's more complicated than that later. But the idea is what? What, was, what is going to influence the meteoric water at any given location? Its value, remember from Gabe and Jim's talk, will be a function of condensation temperature. So the colder you are, the Arctic has more depleted, the tropics are more, you know, you remember that? So the, the temperature at which, there's other things that affect it, but what they're, why this might be a temperature, uh, uh, paleo uh, uh, temperature record is because condensation temperature affects source water. Got it? So that's what the geochemists were all excited about. But what I want to show you is something here. There's some noise in this data. Now the geochemists didn't like the noise. They just wanted a straight line relationship. But look at 100 minus 100 per mil. There's an 80 per mil range at that, at that water source. And some of the other folks, the physiologists and other people saying, but wait a minute, maybe there's interesting information in that noise that you're ignoring because you only want it as a, a temperature record. And it turns out there's a lot of interesting information in that noise that we're now looking at. 
Okay, that's my first 15 minute segment. I'm just gonna pause for questions. Probably move on unless there's Chris. What's, uh, what's the answer? What, what kind of things are people? That's the rest of my talk. <laughs> I, I'm, not, I'm not done yet, Chris. <laughs> Is that? Uh, <coughs> tropical trees, um, for doing isotope analysis, how do you decide on an increment to sample if you don't? You just do a microtome. Okay. And you do so, so many microns, cut it, and so many microns, okay. cut it. Okay. So it's a, it's a distance. So what are isotopes in three wings? They, like, in each three wings, right here, it integrates the whole year somehow? Actually, no. Can I go back a little bit? How far back do I have to go? Way back. Uh, and I was going to say this, and I thank you, but what's cool is that that part of the tree ring was actually spring. This part of the tree ring is summer, that part of the tree ring is late summer. So you, and we'll see this later, you can get not just the year, you can get the seasons of the year. Because they, they progress it. When, it. when it comes to creating chronologies, do you, is there like a standard, or is it just kind of, if you don't really know, do you actually send things out to date to like check your work? There's, there's, there's programs that do it, the statistical analysis. Yeah. Yeah. So there, there are classic ways of doing it. Cool. Um, how much error does it introduce to uh, if you weren't to isolate cellulose? That's, that's, that's coming up. Okay. Exactly. Can you start if wildfires occurred in an adjacent forest? Basically? Will wildfires affect isotopes? Yeah. Or can you discern if they tree rings? Yes. Well, fire, fire histories are done by tree rings a lot. That's a big fear. Now, whether they, how they affect the isotopes uh, hasn't been studied as much, but it is something that can be done. Okay, wow. Good questions. <clears throat> I may not get to you, Jed, today. There's just too many questions. <laughs> just too